Thank you very much for the introduction, World Refrigeration Day. Why, why, why do we need a World Refrigeration Day? Why on earth? I remember having the discussion some 10 or 15 years ago with uh, a, a very senior colleague in, in my industry, who I, someone I looked up to and highly respected. And I explained to them the, my, my idea for having such a thing, uh, World Refrigeration Day. And I remember the man, he, he's, he's a lovely man. Unfortunately, he's no, no longer with us. He listened very carefully and smiled in that uh, paternal way. And at the end of it, after I'd finished, he, he sort of patted me on and said, that's very good. But we all know already why refrigeration is important. Why on earth would we need a day for that? Said, oh. So a little bit later, I said, oh, that's, does your wife know what you do? No, no, my wife. No, I can't tell my wife. What? And you have children. He was, in fact, he had children that were older than me at the time. Have they gone into, oh, no, no, not at all. He said, they, they have no interest. He said, they, they really do not know what we do. And I think that will resonate with, with everybody on this call today. We, we all know why refrigeration is important, why cooling is important, and why it's so necessary for the world. So I don't need to uh, flog that one to you all here. But you also probably have all been in very similar situations where you've tried to explain to somebody else why it is important. And you've probably seen the same blank expressions that, that I've seen. And it, the, the point of World Food Radio is to try and break down these, these bubbles that we're working in. We're all working in now, particularly in social media, we all have these social bubbles, these work bubbles, uh, the, uh, that, that we communicate with people that we get along with very well and, and speak the same language. If I say F gas to you or, or GWP, you'll, you'll all know instantly what I'm talking about. If I try saying that to the waiter in, in, the, in the restaurant, uh, I usually get a, a blank, not that I do, I hasten to add, um, but it's, you will know the blank expressions that we often get. So the, the, the concept is to try and break out of this. And if you've been to a party, as uh, I've been to one or two, you probably know that one of the things that people try and do is, is an icebreaker, where you try and speak to somebody who you don't know or, or there's some sort of game or something to try and break the ice, to try and break the bubble. And it's a perfect analogy. What we need to do is to learn to speak a different language. Don't start with the, the FGAS uh, or the registration or, or the, the GWP of the latest refrigerant. Just that, that is not the way to break the ice. Well, it might create the ice, but it's not the way to break the ice. Um, so what, what we've done over the last few years is try to simplify the language that we're using and to change the audience to suit the audience that we're trying to reach out to. And that is not quite as simple as, as it seems because... I know that because I've tried to get the uh, other other members of our industry do it, and they they all know, and I'm sure you all know that the importance of trying to change this message. And yet there they go again. They arrange another conference. They arrange another set webinar. They arrange another something. We end up talking to ourselves. We we are very good at talking to ourselves. We are not so good at breaking out. And try as we might, and I, I've got a lot of respect for so many people around the industry, around the world, we fall back into type too easily. We fall back into arranging yet another conference. Great, you've got 364 days of the year to do that. Please don't do that on World Refrigeration. Try to speak to somebody, try to be a, do an icebreaker. So uh, I'm keep, trying to keep track on time. So that we started out with trying to use very simple language. We, we had things um, cold chain for life, just trying to introduce not, not the whole concept of a train, a cold chain, but just to introduce the word cold chain to people in the street or people wherever you meet in your social sphere. And it did it work? Possibly. It just happened that, that that was a few months before the pandemic. So the cold chain and the vaccines were, were very much, it was, it was, I don't like to say good timing. It was fortunate timing uh, that we, we had that as a theme. This year, the theme is um, cooling matters. Now, cooling matters, that is intentionally broad. Cooling matters can mean anything that you want it to mean. It can mean human comfort, uh, food preservation, We've talked about preservation of vaccines, but it can also mean the environment. We, 
I think again, everybody on this call will accept that the uh, the environment is 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 warming, and our role within that, the environmental impact of refrigerant, cooling does matter on so many levels. It, it also matters for the economy. It matters for jobs. It can mean anything to anybody. But take these little whatever works for you, and start to sp speak to the outside world in a in a different language about cooling matters. And this year we've we've done. Uh, I'll be. I'll try and wrap up fairly quickly. We've done something completely different. Completely different. After three, this is our fourth year, and every year previously, we have gone down the working with our our industry partners, and we get sucked back in. And I mean that in a nice way. Back into doing what they know how to do. So this year we we've not. At, and I mean that politely because they are very good at that. But this year we've we've partnered with uh, something a group called Chefs for the Planet, who know nothing about refrigerant. They are cooks. They are chefs. They they work with um, cooking, as you see on every day on the food. They work in restaurants, uh, but they work with food, food and fresh food, and delivering food to the plate to the customer is what their focus is. What a great way into people's lives, and I'm not to, <laughs> including our own outside of our circles, everybody likes fresh food on their face. Everybody likes something, a nice recipe. Everybody. It, it is on every TV channel on every continent I've ever been to, some cookery program. So our, our campaign this year, although Cooling Matters is our main theme, we are also launching on this Sunday, on June the 26th, Cooling Keeps Food Fresh campaign, which will be fronted by chefs, doing with recipe cards, with cookery, with talking chef's language. Ah. You know the phrase, never work with children and animals. Well, I, I'm tempted to say never work with chefs, but I, I won't go into that now because they've been very supportive. They are using their language to explain why food is important to them and what they do and how it affects the taste, but why having food that is preserved in the, from the refrigerator is, is important to them. And also in the, social, the sustainability uh, context, um, it is important for food wastage, food loss. So all these things get wrapped up, but we won't be using our usual language. That is, that is what we're trying to achieve. We're in year four now. Uh, hopefully you will all take something away from this. It's the same with flammable refrigerants. I know we're gonna get, I'm running out of time. Running flammable refrigerants, great party breaker. I'm shaking my head. But it, but it is an important subject and it's something that the public and everybody else needs to know. When it comes to the bubbles, the policy makers that we all want to influence and, and we all want to influence somebody, we need to approach this from more than one angle. We cannot just be the, the technical people banging on their door, telling them, you know, we, we become the people who are banging on their door, whatever message we're trying to tell them. If we can approach it from all different angles and from with different voices, I think we will have a much better success. And I think that's so important because cooling does matter and we all need to take that to heart. And I will close at that. It, was, it would have been a great presentation, but I hope my voice has, has, has sufficed for now. If anybody wants the presentation afterwards, I will, I will gladly share it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing the details of the presentation and we really appreciate you being with us today. In spite of the current heat wave we are experiencing in Europe, for all of us in this webinar, the Global Sustainable Cooling Community World Refrigeration Day is the coolest day of the year. So we are really looking forward for Sunday to celebrate. And we really appreciate everyone, all of the attendees joining today. We know it's a taxing week for the National Ozone Units as the durations of the 90th Executive Committee of the Multilateral Fund are ongoing this week in Montreal. Before I move to our next speakers, I would like to quickly cover a few housekeeping topics. I would appreciate if you can all identify yourselves and your organizations, uh, if you change the name settings uh, next to your names, we will know who you represent. We would appreciate that you all keep your microphones muted and to notify that today's webinar is being recorded. And as Stephen said, we will share a link with you after the event is complete. And we hope you can then share it with our colleagues. Finally, I wanted to mention that this webinar should be as interactive as possible. So please use the questions and answers chat feature at the bottom of your screens. 
If you think a question should be for a specific speaker at any point, just type it in there and I will either post it to the speaker during the Q&A session or hold it for feedback round at the end of the event. Um, and without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to Ole Nielsen, who's the chief of the Montreal Protocol Division at UNIDO, and Ole joins us this morning from Montreal. Thank you very much, Bettina. I tried in advance to share my screen, so just uh, can you see my screen? Okay, I yes. see thumbs up. <clears throat> Perfect. Uh, and also thanks, Stephen, for your introductory remarks. I realize what we will present today is probably not an icebreaker, but I think still important uh, because we will we will focus on on flammable refrigerants and in particular on, on hydrocarbons. And, and we do it because they are probably one of the most perfect refrigerants we have. They have excellent thermodynamic properties. Um, they belong to the natural refrigerants, so they have the minimum impact on, on the environment. So from most perspectives, they are great. The only disadvantage is that they are all flammable and therefore the use of them is perceived to be dangerous. It may not be so uh, as long as you know what you do. And I think the presentation that comes later on uh, will focus on what you need to do when you, when you handle hydrocarbons. I think a wider uptake of hydrocarbons requires changes from the refrigeration industry. Usually people are not happy to be brought out of their comfort zone, but I think it's, it's needed. But a major driver to bring people out of the comfort zone is what I call regulatory certainty. When you know what's going to happen in future, you can also adjust accordingly. And in regards to the refrigeration industry, we have seen it during the last 30 years when first the CFCs were banned, then the the HCFCs were banned and now the HFCs are being banned. So <clears throat> we have seen that industry can deliver amazing results. And I will just, before the main presentation gives you a few examples of recent developments in regards to regulatory certainty. Being in Montreal, of course, I have to start, start with the Kigali Amendment from 2016. And on this slide, I show you uh, maybe I can even, uh, on this slide, I show you the phase down schedule for, for developing countries, the so-called group one countries, all of those, most of them that will have the first reduction target in 2024. The, the Kigali amendment is not a reduction in terms of kilograms, but it's a reduction in terms of, of um, CO2 emission reduction. And uh, you can take the Kigali, reduction schedule, and I put here on the right, <clears throat> the global warming potential. Um, and you can, I just assume that a country would have on average a global warming potential of their inventory of 1,500, uh, and that needs to be reduced to 20%, meaning that when the Kigali amendment is fully implemented, the average DWP in a country should be 300. And I think that gives us clear indication on which refrigerants that will last and which uh, will not. <clears throat> also, uh, within the EU, we saw a couple of months ago, the commission issuing the draft revision of the FGAS regulation. <clears throat> and that is quite ambitious. And here you can see the, the phase down schedule for, uh, proposed for the European Union, and it aims at almost nothing when fully implemented. <clears throat> the FGAS regulation also has some prohibitions and they are very interesting in particular in regards to hydrocarbons. Uh, I show you here just two in, in, in relation to residential air conditioning. And I think in particular number B saying that split systems with a capacity up to 12 kilowatt um, cannot have a DWP higher than 150 by 1st of January, 2027. Uh, I think then we all pretty much know what will work in split air conditioners and what will not. And the only thing that will work, that's actually actually the hydrocarbon. The last slide is also in relate, relation to regulatory certainty because um, the use of hydrocarbons have been restricted by product standard from the IEC. Um, and on the left side, you will see the old IEC standard 
that tells you how much hydrocarbon can you have in a product. Uh, and this, uh, you see the allowed charge on the left side <clears throat> and on the x-axis, you see the area of the room to be air conditioned. And uh, as we all know, less than 150 gram, that is no safety issue. But if we go beyond 150 gram, uh, then we have to be more careful. And the old standard would allow up to, to 600 grams for very large rooms of 70 square meters. We have seen during the last 10 years that it's very difficult to produce a split air conditioner that would actually be within the standard. And those that could be produced would be, would have, it, it has influence on the energy efficiency if the charge is too little. So, so it was very, difficult to actually produce these units. However, very recently, the a revision to the standard was approved uh, and that you see on the right side where the new standard will allow for much higher charges if you apply some safety mitigation measures. Uh, <clears throat> I cannot tell you details of that because I haven't seen the standard, but, but it means with the new revised standard that you can have up to one kilogram of uh, almost one kilogram of uh, hydrocarbon in an air conditioner. And it means that all the products in the market today in Europe, but also outside Europe, uh, would be able to run with hydrocarbon within the standard. And <clears throat> I think this has created a great momentum for us uh, to introduce hydrocarbons on, with a broader use. Um, but we have some barriers, and I think the next presentation will actually focus on some of the barriers on how to overcome them. And uh, with this, I can declare that the stage is ready for hydrocarbon. And thank you so much for your for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Olie, for setting the stage. But before we move to the next part of our session, can I ask all participants and speakers to turn on their cameras so we can take a photo of the event? Just for one second. Excellent, thank you very much. So let me introduce to you Harand and Andreas, who you can see on the screen. Harand Eros has over 20 years of experience in the refrigeration sector, first as a technical project support for very well-known commercial refrigeration firms, and more recently as the lead of refrigeration, cooling, and heat pump technologies in a global pharmaceutical chain. He's a lecturer at the University of Applied Science in Bergenland, a trainer, and more recently, he's the founder and chairman of the Austrian Association of Refrigeration. Andreas has similarly impressive experience in the sector, having worked in large industrial and commercial refrigeration firms, and he's currently the head of customer service training at 8HT Cooling Systems. Harald, Andreas, the floor is yours. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, as I understood it correctly, right, before, as Steve said, the, the real icebreaker for, for doing this is talking at first about the EFCAS regulation. So Ole did already uh, talked about it. And we just want to show you the, the importance of this. And because, as you know, it's the um, sum of kilograms of refrigerant multiplied by its GWP, its global warming potential. And in the future, you will see we will only have about 5% going down to, to, to 2% that we had already. So as we think that the, um, the kilograms will be the same, so we have to focus on the global warming potential. So the second thing as an icebreaker is always talking about GWP. And here you can see the GWP of various refrigerants with the um, different um, numbers from the assessment reports of the IPCC. And all those refrigerants that have a very low number of GWP, they have here a safety class between A3, A2L, B2L. And um, behind the safety class, 
is the flammability and the toxicity. So A means it's non-toxic, B toxic, and the number one, two, three says it's flammable or not. And you can see we have one, that means no, not flammable. We have two L, that means uh, low flammability, free and a higher flammability. The only difference between two and two L is that it has a um, low burning velocity. And if we go back, you can see here the numbers, um, 717 is CO2, uh, sorry, is, is ammonia, 744 is CO2, and R290, which is an A3, is propane. R608 is isobutane. So all those natural refrigerants, as all I said, those hydrocarbons, they have a very low global warming potential, but they are flammable. And we are here to talk a little bit about um, how to use flammable refrigerants. The main focus is the fire triangle. You see, what is necessary so that you that something get burns? You heat on one on one hand. You need the heat. For example, here um, we have an ignition source. Do you need oxygen and a uh, high temperature? And you need the fuel. So you need the the perfect concentration um, of a gas that it can burn. And the importance of this is if you put one of those things in the triangle away, it's impossible that those gases can burn. So if we have a look at the flammability levels, as I said already, there is a special area where gases burn. If this uh, mixture is too low, if it is below the lower flammability level, it won't burn. And if it's too rich, if it's um, upper, the upper flammability level, it also won't burn. So one thing to keep in mind is just to be below or above this combustion area. Here you can see the various flammability level limits of uh, refrigerants as we focus um, right now on, on propane because it's really quite, quite common in uh, our refrigeration sector already, you can see you have a, flow of, a lower flammability limit of 2.1 and an upper flammability level of 9.5 volume percent. So within 2.1 and 9.5, the gas will burn. So what we have to think when we install new equipment. First is we have to prevent the formation of explosive atmospheres. We have to avoid ignition sources, and we have to limit the impact of explosion sources. How to prevent the formation of explosive atmospheres? If you think, for example, of a machinery room, here you have a ventilation system. So if there is a leakage and the leakage, the um, flammable refrigerant comes into the machinery room, you have the, um, the ventilation systems, um, there are two different things. One is you have to um, do this in the standard operation with a four times air exchange. And if there is an emergency ventilation, um, you have to calculate it for 15 times the air change so that you don't get those flammable mixture in there. This is with a machinery room. So if you just um, make your machinery room smaller, 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 and you really put only the refrigeration system in the inside, then you have a ventilated enclosure. So you can see the refrigerant, the refrigeration system is inside an enclosure, and you have a ventilation system already inside of this. And if um, there is a leakage, you have a detector and the flammal gas will be carried out. And the interesting thing about this is that you can put those ventilated, ventilated enclosure almost everywhere because there is only, a, let's say, a, a danger zone. We will talk about explosive zones in, in a few minutes inside this enclosure. The next thing is avoid ignition sources. Um, when you think about what could be an ignition source, um, 
it depends on the various refrigerants you have, but it's always electrical um, circuits, hot surfaces, and any kinds of sparks. Sparks that you can get from switches, from um, people, from tools, and from poorly grounded equipment. So as I've already said before, there are um, zones to declare explosive atmospheres. Um, there are three zones, zone zero, one, and two. In refrigeration systems, we mostly have the zone two, the flammel gas is unlikely to present, to be present during normal operations. The other one says that it might occur during normal operation or it um, can occur for a longer period. So in refrigeration systems, the system itself has to be tight, so it's, it's unlikely to be present. So normally we have a zone two. Zone two means that we have to use special tools inside this zone, and we have to um, declare on site where we have this zone two that no ignition source is built inside there. How could such a zone two look like? Here are safety distance, and um, the, the numbers you can see here for distances, this has to be calculated um, by the um, 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 mass of uh, refrigerant you have inside the systems. So these are only numbers um, for, for um, just to, to have a, a few thoughts on how it could be. For example, with an outdoor unit, you have a safety distance about three meters around it if you have um, propane inside. And when you think, oh, are there already split units with propane? Then I can say, yes, of course. We at the Westreich um, Gesellschaft of the Kette Technik, Austrian Association of Refrigeration, we already have one propane split unit uh, in use. Um, Ole, thanks for the present of this. Um, so this is with split systems. The other one is if you have chillers, you also have to think about three meters uh, in a horizontal way and one meter uh, in a vertical way where you have this zone two. Here we took a picture of an example on site. And the thing is, should this installation be done? Um, if you look at the picture and you ask yourself the question, um, this is filled with propane. And you can think of, well, what can happen? What is the impact of this? How often can this happen? Can we do anything to prevent that something happens? And what, what should be done first? So let's think about what can happen. Um, as I said, there is propane, a really flammable refrigerant inside. Then maybe there could be a leakage inside. So if a leakage is inside, then flammable refrigerant can go to the outside. How often can it happen? Well, normally not. It's unlikely that it occurs, but it can. If the flammable refrigerant goes to the outside, yeah, there are different things that can happen. Um, you can see there are stairs in the back, so maybe um, it can close um, because uh, propane is um, uh, heavier than air, so it will flow down the stairs. Maybe someone is smoking down the stairs, so it can get come to an explosion. So that would be quite a thing that should have to be prevented. The other thing is there you can see there are some boxes where we don't know what's inside there. So um, all those boxes, um, they, they have to be took away. But can this be easily done? Yes, of course, this could be done, for example, with a fence. And the other thing is in the back, you can see a kind of ventilation system. So you can also, you also have to think about um, if there is a ventilation in, this is an outlet, but there will also be a ventilation inlet. So maybe if we have a leakage, um, then, explosive air can get inside the building. So this should also be prevented. So those things have to be kept in mind and you have to look on site, can we do something against it or not? Um, 
just to, to, to repeat those things, you can see um, propane is heavier. So you have to prevent um, if you have, uh, for example, working space or anything like that below um, the ground. Also, you have to keep in mind um, if you have an inlet of a ventilation system that you have a, a distance of a minimum of five meters that it go, don't go inside the building. You also have to think that for each kilogram of propane, you have to have a ventilation of 1,600 um, square meters per hour to have a um, uh, 0.25 percentage of the LFL so that it don't have a, a flammable concentration inside. You also have to think of the safety out valve outlets um, that you have also a zone about it and you have to um, put the safety valve outlet um, somewhere where you don't have a problem with it. As I've already said, you can put a, a fence around it. Um, if you do this, you have to look that um, only people can go inside um, that are well trained, that know about the dangerous of those things, you have to look of manholes, flammable materials, and all of that that, um, that may be there. And also you have to mark the area so that everyone knows there's a flammable thing inside. And with those four questions we, we already um, asked before, what we did is we already did a risk analysis and a risk assessment on site. So, um, the thing of a risk analysis is, at first, you determine the limits of the refrigeration system. Um, with this chiller we have seen before, it's very easy because you have one chiller and you look about around the surrounding area. With a slip system, it's more difficult because you have an indoor unit, you have an outdoor unit, and you have pipings in there. So you have to focus on, okay, what are what is your system? And then you have to identify the hazards. And I think it's the, the biggest issue because you have to know what may be occurred. Then you have assessed the probability, how, how, um, how often will um, a thing occur, and you have to assess the impact. And with all of that, you can, do, you can think about of a mitigation. Can something be done to prevent the problem? To put this into numbers, this is our um, thing on, on how to do risk assessment. At first, we have the probability. Very rarely, we give them a value, a number of one. Very often, we give them a value of five. And then we have the impact of harmless with a value of one, and the impact of catastrophic with a value of five. And if we multiply this, we will have the risk. So here you can see something that is very rarely and had a catastrophic impact, might have a number five. Um, and maybe it's better to focus on those things that may occur more often or that may have a bigger impact. For example, if things are dangerous and occur often, it's, more, it's, it's better that those things have to be mitigated earlier. So I would hand over to Andreas for telling us a little bit about working with flammable refrigerants. Thank you, Harald. So um, to take it over for the working with flammable refrigerants, um, we think it's good. Hopefully it's working. It's not working. No, take one. Here. Uh, then take this one. We have more than one. <laughs> Just scroll there. Yeah, it's working. Um, so we have to talk about uh, basic rules, basic rules on how to work with system with flammable refrigerants. First of all, uh, we have to, to secure ourselves. We are monitoring the concentration. So as Harold already told, we have the, the border of lower uh, flammable uh, yeah, concentration which is with propane 2.1 uh, percent of the volume. So here we should also reflect on uh, explosive area regulations, also which can be locally different. 
and here it might be good to have also a view on, on local regulations but normally we think about 50 percent downwards to 20 percent is a good value to work with uh, monitoring on concentration if we have a look on the second point it's the ventilation of the working area so to mitigate a risk even if we have a leakage uh, we can do uh, a distribution of the, the refrigerant, either it's R290 or something else, um, to do it with a wider area. So to mitigate the risk of to have an explosive area inside a working space or inside a room or whatever. And if we think on the third part, so also thinking on the triangle of uh, the fire, we have to eliminate the ignition sources. So that's the, the basic thinking which we sh should do ever. And if we go further, so, sorry. What's happening here? What did you do, my dear friend? Sorry. <laughs> put it here, yeah. Uh, first thing, the concentration monitoring. Um, so everyone should have a personal gas detector. If we are working with propane, it could be easily that we work with a standard gas detector, which we use for leakages. But this is completely different to a personal gas detector. So please keep in mind with a, a leakage detector, we are working inside a unit or somewhere else, somewhere higher. Uh, if we have an indoor unit in propane, if we have a split system, a heat pump or whatever equipment, it could be higher uh, than the ground. So, and as we know, most of the HCs are heavier than air. So we have to do the detection on the basement. So on the ground floor. And that should be known. So, and uh, it's really a good thing to think on it, yeah? To have this personal detector on prior to entering a working area. So always being detecting where you are and what you are doing. Take this one. It's working? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so the second thing is to have also the, the personal protective equipment on the person. So if we have a look to ourselves, to protect ourselves, that's the first thing. Then we have to protect also others and the, the surrounding. So first of all, it could be loud. So have a look on your ears to protect them. Have a look, since we are working with refrigerant on your hands, yeah, and also on your body. So you have to protect with clothes, to wearings, which could not be flammable at all. So you have to protect yourself also therefore <clears throat> for the skin. And also immediately if we work with refrigerant, um, also with each seats, it's the same. You have to wear glasses. So I'm always wearing glasses, but that are not safety glasses. So if I would work with refrigerant, I have to take in addition to my glasses, special glasses for protection. So as it's shown here, so safety classification three. And if we have a look also on our shoes, yeah, so they should be anti-static. So that's one of the, the major things uh, which we have to think on what could be an ignition source. And here, if we wear good clothes, which are anti-static, we also have to use shoes, which are anti-static. Last point, which is maybe minor for HCs is a gas mask. So if we are entering areas where other flammable refrigerant can be used. Uh, so we have also to, to think on if they are a B2L or B3. So there we have to, to really be sure to maybe also wear a gas mask uh, if they're toxic. So if we look on standard situations, which might be always the case if we are working with refrigerants, we should be aware that even if it's standard, we can think on safety zones, as Harald has already explained. So we have somewhere in our systems always zones for classification two. So if we think on connections to existing system, <clears throat> so filling 
evacuating uh, and that um, all things where we have to, to adopt something inside or something surrounding the refrigerant circuit, we have to think on zone two. Yeah? So where refrigerant, which is AC, could occur. So if we think on this standard situation to have the evaporator, the condenser, the compressor, liquid receiver, and something like that. So also think on how to be safe. So you see here on first place, uh, the gas detector. So the green one, you see also a fan, yeah, which is proving us a bit of air movement so that it could not be possible that we have explosive area. Hope it works. Yeah, hope you have a fan. So if you do not have a fan, open a door, a window. It should be in one line. And then you also have air movement inside the room. And to be really sure, you have to have a fire excursion. But if we further think on working, yeah, it could happen that, yeah, you never know. Uh, you have a breakage in the hose. You're emptying the hose while not thinking to shut off the valve. And then the rest of the gas, which is inside the hose under pressure, is leaving. It's leaving the pipe, it's leaving the hose. And then you can have a particular area where you can have a small explosion. Yeah? So the starting point of a fire. So here you should be aware. So always do it in the right procedure. Close, uh, build in wells for the hoses prior um, to, to leave them from the equipment so that there could not be any risk. Yeah? Maybe it's minor because you will have five grams inside the hose. If you have a long hose, it could be 10 grams. But <coughs> believe me or not, uh, you can hurt yourself. Uh, and also it could be a starting point of a maybe possible fire. And if we take this under consideration, uh, it's good to have a ventilation. It's good to have uh, these procedures in place to be safe. So which of the systems which we are using are different to the standard ones. So here are standard tools set it on the, on the screen. So the first point, so normally we, we are able to work with a torch for everything in the refrigerant cycle. Um, so to, to build complete systems uh, of piping, to rebuild complete systems of piping, to open up a refrigerant cycle, um, please remember if we are working with uh, here propane or isoprotane or putane or whatever, uh, HAC, never use a torch. Yeah? Please use a pipe cutter if you have to open up a refrigerant cycle. So that's a major rule and it's maybe different to the working procedures which we have had in the past years. So use a pipe cutter. Um, so you will not have an open flame, and that's also mitigating risk, as we already have heard from uh, Harad. So you have to have the right equipment for vacuuming, yeah, for the manifolds, which are able to work with ACs. So here you have the, the right uh, gauges, you have to have the right pressure settings. Also, the, the charging hoses should be as uh, short as possible, yeah, so that you do not have any refrigerant inside. You have to have the, the pitch off tool. So if we are working with smaller equipment, um, like uh, fridges, like horizontal chest freezers, uh, which have uh, less than 150 gram, you can also repair it inside the, the stores or inside uh, buildings. If we are working on bigger equipment, we already will have a connecting point, uh, which is their strata valve. Uh, on hermetically sealed, you have to pitch uh, this refrigerant cycle to open it up. Yeah? So if we are working on old refrigerants, you should have the right scale. It should be in grams so that you are pretty sure what is inside the whole system. If you have a huge system, maybe gram, it's a, a, a bit too strong. So, but if we do talk on normal, smaller refrigerant cycles, and if you have in mind, to use split systems in the future with R290. Also here, grams are mandatory as scale. We already talked on the uh, protective self-protection on us. Yeah, So do not forget to have a fire uh, distinguisher. It should be one with dry powder. It should not be one with water. 
So you should also be aware of that. It could be CO2 if you have it here, uh, but CO2 has normally less capacity than a fire dry powder type. And the rest, it's quite clear. So if we think on open up a cycle, if we think on working with a cycle, you have a piercer valve, uh, you have a core valve, uh, removing tool, a charger valve. And if we see on this next slide, you have to have maybe to set a new piping, you have to have a pricing set, which is uh, in the normal cases, safe to work. Yeah, and also try nitrogen if we have to flush and, and test the system for tightness, uh, it should be dry nitrogen. So to have maybe if we have water inside, also here the possibility to get width of the water. Vacuum pumps, we would say later on also um, that there should be a special execution for vacuum pumps. So vacuum pumps should be explosive proof. Yeah? And later on, we will also see how to handle and how to treat with it, yeah? because it's a bit different uh, than the work which we did prior with standard H1 refrigerants. And as alternative for bracing, we should think on pressing systems. So here as example, uh, it's lock ring, yeah, but there are others around which are also um, be possible to, to, to buy uh, locally wherever you are, um, but lock ring could be used for smaller dimensions to work without any open flame. And that's a good thing always to mitigate the risk which we do have if we're working with refrigerants which are um, possible to yeah, ignite the fire. Um, please also be aware if we're working with uh, HCs, uh, we have a treat adapter, yeah, which is left treated yeah so it's different than the standard one please aware of that so if we are working with that systems we have to think on that if we think on working in general for recovery of refrigerant we always say please recover that's important <laughs> if we think on legislation and we see that uh, since IPCC 6 report is giving the GWP for propane on 0 0.02, there is no need legally wise to recover R290. But on the other end, it's always good to have it in a recovery bottle to use it again or to, to reuse it in the end, yeah, because here we also can have a reduction in CO2, since also the production of R290 uh, is costing a bit of CO2 emissions. So you have to have, if you uh, working with uh, HCs, also the idea that R290 could be trapped in the oil or inside the system. So you have to, to, to flush the system with dry nitrogen at least for 10 seconds, so that there is no possibility of any trapping of R290 if you're working on that cycle. So always use the right equipment, uh, which we have to use, which ACs, which are also uh, possible to use because of egg zones and also inside ceilings for the, the systems. So if R290 has to be vented, what we should do, yeah? So please keep in mind some basic rules. Do not vent R290 inside a building under any circumstances. So if needed, you can um, yeah, really vent it to the outside. If not, uh, I think it's better, as we already said, it's better to recover. Do not vent if you vent it to the outside to a public area. Yeah? So that's not a good idea. So everything could be ignition source. And here we have to mitigate the risk and we have to know where we are um, yeah, putting, renting R290. If yeah, we have the problem uh, that it's renting itself, we have to inform everyone um, and we have to ensure that local legislation is met by all the measures which we are doing. So that should be already known in front of being uh, a worker with R290 or uh, other HFC, HCs. 
So, uh, you're the better one. <laughs> uh, to come back to the point, if we're working with a vacuum pump, yeah, we have to think on, um, if we are working with a vacuum pump, we are building the vacuum inside the system system by getting the gases out of the system. Since we are getting it out, we have to push it somewhere. Yeah? And normally, if there is no plastic tube, as you can see it right now here on the picture, on the right-hand side, uh, where we then can commingle uh, this gas, it would be in the surrounding of the vacuum pump. So the vacuum pump has to be a special execution. And on the other end, we have to be aware that there is coming gas from the inside of the system, which we do not 100% know if it's uh, or what it is. Yeah? So what is the, the, the mixture of the gas, which we think of. If we think on the gases and how the gases are brought on site, yeah, you know, we have gas cylinders. And as you can see here, as a picture from one provider, you have a red shoulder on the bottle. So that's giving you the color that it's a flame refrigerant. So normally you also have the patch on the shoulders, which is giving you the name and the type of the gas, which is inside here in that case, you can see it's R290. Always also, you should remember that we do have different weights of refrigerants with the volume which we can extract. So here is example you have on the picture in blue, the volume of four kilograms of R134A. And on the other, on the right-hand side, you will see the four kilograms of R290 which has a bigger volume. So therefore you have to have knowledge what volume you can get inside these gas bottles. So please remember also, you should not overfill the gas bottle. So you will always find on every single gas bottle, the net weight of the bottle itself. And then you can calculate what you can do in addition in this bottle. Also remember, as we already said, you have the light hand, left hand treat on the bottle as a connection. I will hand over to Harold again. Thank you. I'd like to talk a little bit about periodic inspections and maintenance. Um, what difficulty is that we don't have um, as much regulations on hydrocarbons, on natural refrigerants, then we have, for example, um, regarding the FCAS regulation. So um, we have to take a look about, for example, the N378, who recommends periodic leak detections depending on the filling quantity. For example, three kilogram once per year, 30 kilograms twice per year, and for 300 kilograms four times per year. And when you think about um, leak detecting, um, here you can see the various methods of detecting leaks. One is to make a, a detection with um, nitrogen that is to be done um, when um, the, um, whole si the, the whole system um, before the startup um, when there is no refrigerant inside. So this is what has to be done at first when the system is not running. If the system is, is running, you can see in the middle the leak detection sprays there um, you can you can put it on the pipes and then they make those little bubbles if there is a, a, a leakage. The other thing is that uh, you have an electronic leak detection. This is what you can see in the middle. That's of course the best thing to um, locate a leak. But what's really really important is that you regularly use your test device. Um, that's one thing that's often not done um, when you go outside and you, you ask technicians on, on what those little things are. Uh, most of them don't even know what it's for. So you have to regularly um, test your electronic leak detection. And the last thing is um, there are some color indicators um, that you put inside the system. And that's one thing that we don't recommend because, um, yeah, there should only be the uh, refrigerant inside the system and not any 
anything else. So, um, uh -huh. um, what we did now is, when you think about leakage test is, uh, we make a survey and we ask 250 participants, what are the top things you can think of where a leak can occur? And maybe you can think yourself on what the three, uh, what the top three points of leakage are and put it right in front of yourself. And as you can see, this is already um, the final survey. So you can see on the left side, there is one thing that almost everyone says, okay, this is the main point of, of a leakage. So I will give you the first seven. Um, as we asked, we asked about some uh, special valves, for example, solenoid valve, vibration tempers, solder joints, um, we ask about the hot gas line, condensers, and Schrader valves. So these are quite often. Schrader valves, for example, with 42% is a thing where you have to look at. But the main three points are stiffing, stuffing boxes. Uh, and, uh, let's see. The, yeah, the video works. Um, one of the things is why there is um, this uh, place for leakages is that the little um, head, is it called head that? Too. Yeah, is missing yeah. so um, that the refrigerant um, can go through the, the stuffing box. The next thing is evaporators. And when you think of what sometimes is in an evaporator, for example, in a supermarket where you have pickles and acid things and all of that, then it's okay that you that you can have some leakages there. And the number one thing is flare joints. 98%, um, almost everyone said that flare joints are really a big problem. So why do we tell you this? Because this is not uh, mainly on flammable refrigerants, it's just on, on refrigerants in a global thing is, when we know that the leakage occur um, at those points in the refrigeration system, then we have to specially take care on all those points if we use flammable refrigerants. Hand over again. Yeah, I hand over. Yeah. We don't we, have that much we, time. We, we have to be to recover a bit of time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if we think on the service, um, so I, I tried it again. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, so we all, always have to think on how to be safe in using our equipment. And the first of all is how we store gases. Yeah. So we need gases in our refrigeration cycles. So we need them to store somewhere. And the next part would be we have to transport it. So to have a look on it, yeah, there are some basic rules, yeah? some basic rules which we should know and also local regulations, which we have to take care of for sure. Uh, but if we think on safety measures, yeah, uh, some are special yeah, um, and some are for all the gases. So we can go through it. So gas bottles have to be uh, protected against warming, fire, dangerous corrosion, mechanical damage, out unauthorized excess. We should secure the gas tanks stored upright or laying. If we use LPGs, so R290, they should be stored upright in the end. So not laying around, uh, even if they secured. So they have, they have to be stored upright. And if we think on where to store, we should always think on it's heavier than air. So if we have to, to store it somewhere in the basement, we have to ensure proper ventilation. We have to ensure also measurement if it's really under the level which we are working normally. Wells must be protected, it's clear, uh, and transferring gases in storage room is not permitted at all. Yeah. And if we think again, just send it. 
Yeah, how oh, it's working again. Uh, if we think of transporting, we have also to think what quantities we have to transport. So if we if we think on smaller quantities, we can use our own vehicles. If not, if we go for bigger quantities, we have to use special transport. Also reflecting always where you are on our beautiful earth, which legal obligations would you have? If you use smaller transporting vehicles, you have to have at least a bit of ventilation. So two openings, uh, 100 millimeters squared by 100 millimeters should be enough to have enough ventilation if you're transporting refrigerants, overall, especially HCs. So we should also think over on how to protect ourselves. And therefore, always we have to, to have a fire ext extinguisher with us. Yeah. And always take into account that all the fittings are screwed, yeah, not in the car. Yeah. So we only are allowed to use the bottles itself with the safety cap on it. Yeah. It's not allowed to be fast in operating with the bottles to all those transportation with all the fittings, which should not be on the bottle itself if we are transporting it. Having a look back in all the things which we already heard from uh, Harald, we can commingle it in one picture. Yeah, if we are working uh, with a unit inside the room yeah, and also repairing it, having a look on it, uh, what's wrong with it, we have to take care on the basic rules which we already have heard. So please use your personal detective device. Yeah, first. If you enter a room, activate it, and you are having crossed off the first point. Second point is uh, have a bit of ventilation. So in that case, we can also use a window and a door. Um, have nearby your fire, the dry powder fire extinguisher. Yeah? Please also secure that there is no ignition possible. Fire lighter, fire electricity, by a torch. And also uh, have a look on unauthorized access. Yeah? So there should not be any person in the working area which should not be there at all. So if we have these basic rules, we can ask ourselves what I have to do if I would work with the refrigerants, uh, which we're talking uh, the, the whole session long. Yeah? So we have always to have a look on the local legislation which could be different. So it, in Europe, it's pretty clear. In North America, South America, if we talk, talk in Asia, it's a bit different. Um, and all the, the rules which are there, we have to think of. But we strongly recommend from our side to do a local training also uh, from people which are really working in that countries already for a couple of time with the refrigerants. So since local regulations should be or could be different than the standard procedures, which we think which you should use or which we should use uh, in the refrigerant business. All the equipment which we would work on would be labeled. Yeah. So if we think on smaller equipment, so plugging cabinets, so small refrigeration units would be normally filled with less than 150 grams uh, per circuit. So it would be uh, quite a mitigated quite a minor risk yeah, to work on that unit. But if we think on, on bigger units, on heat pumps, on split systems, on chillers, on something like that, it could be really significantly more refrigerant inside. And you have to think more over what can happen if you have a leakage. Please remember, if we are talking on R290, which we are using in our refrigerant systems, it's different than the R290, which is used on your barbecue grill. The, the one which is on the barbecue grill, you can smell immediately. If we talk on the refrigerant, it's pure. It's nearly 100% pure R290, so it's odorless. You could not smell it at all. So you have to have, again, your personal detector with you because it's impossible yeah, to smell it prior to getting danger. So, provide ventilation. That's one of the cases which we already talked on. So there are the same rules which we already have seen in the slides prior. But please yeah, think on that. So 
if we work on propane, you have to double think what could be ignition source. So youth should think on cell phones, on electronic devices, on ele other electronic devices, which are nearby to the unit which you're working on or to the chiller which you're working on. You should always have uh, preventing others to get inside your working area where could be a zone two. So that's the, the, the proper safety distance which you have to think on. If we are disposing, we have also for the smokers a bad news. Yeah? You are not allowed to smoke at all. Yeah? If you're working, so I, I know a lot of people which are smoking. Yeah, uh, If you're a smoker, please do not smoke if you're working with PCs. So that's a really bad thing. So, and it's really dangerous if we think on ignition. Yeah? If we think on the second rule, exclude explosive atmosphere, we have also to think we have to flush the system with nitrogen, only to highlight here a few points, um, because there could be a trapped gas. And that's important for your own safety net. So please use here a gas to flush the system to be quite sure that there could not be any trapped gas at all. The presence of persons, if you work on a special machinery room, it's normally no problem. If you work um, for a split system, which would be maybe our future or a heat pump, you also have to tell the people, which are maybe the building owners, that they have to be a bit far away. So if we think on the picture Harold showed you, it could be a good idea to have two meters, three meters as a distance that these people are not in front of the unit at all if you are working with the unit itself. If we are repairing, we have more or less the same ideas to think on, to think on how to exclude ignition sources, how to exclude ex explosive atmosphere and how to exclude unauthorized, unauthorized presence. So that's the same ideas always, which we think on, and it's coming from the top to the bottom and always being the same idea what we are doing if we have to have a safe operation within the new old refrigerant, which we will use for the future, as we have seen prior in the entrance speech of Ole. And I will hand over again to Harald. Thank you. So let's come to an end. And just, just to summarize the main, the main things uh, up. We said flammable natural refrigerants are really future proof because they are environmentally friendly. And they are safe to use when you think of some special thing that we taught you the last hour. The main focus is to think on the flammable triangle. So the main thing is to prevent heat, the right concentration and oxygen at once. If you put one thing away, then you don't have a problem with flammable refrigerants. Just to repeat, it's important to switch off all electrical devices in the danger zone. Um, you have to detect and remove ignition sources. You have to separate danger area and set up warning signs. Always use a mobile gas extraction system. Always use an electronic gas detector to identify leaks. Keep a fire extinguisher nearby and always use your personal protective equipment. So that's all from us. Um, if you have um, some more questions on this topic, um, there exists already a Norwegian and a German uh, book about flammable refrigerants. And we are working on an international version, version that will be available hopefully in winter. Um, 
Bettina or Ole can uh, forward our contact details if there are any questions. And now, yeah, we would, we are very pleased to, to answer you some questions. To be honest, we, we didn't have a look uh, into the, the uh, chat box. So maybe Bettina, if there is anything uh, someone like to ask us, now it's the right time. All right, let's start with the first question from our participants. Many of them say they would benefit from having these slides. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much. Then we will share them with everyone who has registered. Second question comes from Hyacinth from Cameroon. She wants to know, what is the main difference between a leak detector and a personal gas detector? Does the gas detector have a wide range? Do you want to share? So <laughs> the personal detector uh, is one device which should be laid somewhere on the ground. So the other device, which you can see with the sniffler, has always a smaller area where you will detect. Yeah? So that's a working tool. The other is a tool which are yeah, a protective device for yourself yeah, in the end. So since we have two different areas to work, one where we detect for our personal safety where the gas could be commingled, so on the floor. The other thing is where you detect where in detail is the leakage on the pipe. Yeah, so that's the main difference. And the electronic, just to to yeah. to to um um um, say a few sentences again. Uh, more the electronic detector says only okay, there is a flammable gas or not, and the personal gas detector also says what concentration is. Is it is it a, a concentration where you might have a problem? Is it um, twenty five percent of LFL or is it already in a danger zone? To all our participants, oh, I see one hand raised in Najam then. Would you like to have the floor? Please unmute yourself. I'm sorry, have I mispronounced your name? I see one person with your hand raised. You can have the floor. Hello. I don't know if somebody, uh, uh, because I didn't see uh, my, my place here. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, I'm Najmuddin uh, uh I have a relation with the uh, uh, Ozone Union, Ozone uh, Unit for Libya here. And uh, interesting on the uh, uh, this uh, refrigeration day. Well, I tried to uh, contact you, maybe because some problems of the uh, what's called the uh, the internet here, what we have here. So I'm trying for a long time to contact you. Uh, anyhow, uh, I did my uh, my hand up uh, just to know that uh, for you. That I'm, 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 I'm now with you here. I'm following the uh, conversation with the gentlemen here, and if I have any uh, a question, I'm gonna do. I will allow my hand right now. And sorry for uh, the interruption. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further questions? No. Uh, up to now, I have no any uh, further questions. But maybe after some, some time, maybe if after means, uh, I will do that, Mr. Oli Nelson. Uh, it's nice to see you, by the way. Uh, thank you for all of you. Thank you. One more opportunity. Anyone has any further questions? Please raise your hand or write in the chat. Oh. We have one in the chat. It says, FLIR connection is not recommended and connections must be airtight for the flame or refrigerants, correct? Would you recommend the alternatives in the cost-effective order? So I think, and if we think on hermetically sealed uh, systems, 
left joint <coughs> would not be the right choice. So it should be a tight connection. So if we think on the definition, what is a hermetically sealed connection, it should be less than three grams a year. And that's um, if we have seen uh, the high rate of possible leakages on the flare joints, it's not a good idea to use it in the future. And also if we think on pricing, uh, so it might be cheaper to use uh, a screw joint uh, instead of a flare joint. Yeah? So we have to think on how to connect it um, for the future. So to be proven here also in, in meaning of to have no leakage. Yeah, but of course the best thing is raising. Raising. Um, that's the, the, the most, most um, yeah, safe, safest thing just to at first to have a look that there isn't a flammable refrigerant inside the system. And when you put things away, then to brace it. And the alternative from our point of view might be to have some press, press fitting systems in the future. Like rock, lock ring, yeah. Yeah, whatever. Like that. Um, so press system for smaller diameters would be uh, a fast choice and uh, a good choice uh, if we have to connect parts. Our next question, if, is there a recommended size charge for the extinguisher yeah. size? What question? I did not. Would you be so kind to repeat it yeah. once more, please? Sure. <laughs> is there a recommended size charge for the extinguisher size? Size. Of the extinguisher, the fire extinguisher. To uh, be honest, I don't know this. Uh, so there are local regulations. Um, so keeping in mind um, that you was a fire extinguisher, you could not um, cover a, a big fire. Yeah. So you have to have it on hands to to stop a starting fire. So therefore, it's maybe good to have a small CO two uh, or a dry. Uh, a dry fire extinguisher, which normally is the case on five kilogram, 10 kilograms. Yeah. So if we're talking on CO2 and you have a small bottle with you, it could be maybe a half a kilogram. So for smaller sizing. Yeah. So it could be also two kilograms. So depending on the sizing of the refrigerant cycle, which you're talking on or which we are dealing with. So it's always the case that we should have also an eye on local regulations. So what we are using normally across Europe it's around about five kilograms as dry uh, fire distinguisher. If we talk on North America, it's around about two kilogram in CO2. So it's always also depending where you are. So if we are talking on Asia, it's also different. So there you have normally a smaller bottle because the people think they can get the fire earlier. So that's depending always on local regulations. Yeah. Asking if, in addition to the information on flammable refrigerants, we have training materials for the natural refrigerants which are not flammable, such as CO2, ammonia, and nitrogen. Margaret, I assume you want them in English. We'll make sure you get them. Next question comes from Mary. Some technicians have challenges working with the short hoses. Are there any extra safety measures which can be applied so as to use longer hoses? Uh, that's, that's one thing. Um, the problem is when you have quite long hoses then, um, and if you don't work properly with it, you might have a quite big quantity of uh, flammable refrigerant inside. So it's always a difficulty uh, that this should be as, as short as possible. And in the other way, it's just the thing with the electrical cables, they should be as long as possible because you don't have to um, have the, the tools uh, inside, let's say, a flammable area. Thank you very much. I think we're getting towards the end of the time allocated for our webinar. I want to especially thank all of our speakers. And before I have a few closing remarks, I would ask Ole if he wants to also greet the participants. Yes, of course. I would like to do that. <clears throat> so first of all, thanks to our speakers, to Stephen for opening opening the webinar and for Harald and Andreas for providing insight on, on hydrocarbons. I, 
I actually thought I should not be here for the whole time since I have a meeting waiting for me, but uh, I felt I better hear it to the very end. And I think it was was very interesting. And, and uh, thank you so much for your contribution. Also, I would like to thank the participants I have seen. We have been around 50 participants during the whole session and they are actually still with us. I think this is great shows that is an interest and uh, we are very happy we could could share a little light on, on the hydrocarbons for you today. Uh, so that would be my thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Ole. I would like to also thank the participants and speakers, and I would like to share my own takeaways as a way of summary. Stephen mentioned the importance of using simpler language to explain what the refrigeration sector is about, and the need to use different angles to influence policy making. Ole reminded us that the perception of risk in handling flammable refrigerants can be overcome. He also showed how there is a regulatory certainty towards the shift to flammable refrigerants at the global level from the Kigali Amendment, at the EU directive level, and finally for manufacturers defining the International Electrotechnical Commission standards. Andres and Harald gave us a real masterclass of flammable electric refrigerants, their environmental aspects, and discussed their safe handling, starting from the fire triangle. They presented the importance of having the necessary tools, the PPE, identifying and preventing leakage, to have proper storage, and they explain training and certification of technicians. We would also like to build on UNIDO's work to raise awareness on the Kigali Amendment. In the current geopolitical circumstances, with increased pressure on energy and food supply chains, contributions from all sectors are necessary. Thank you all again for joining us for this webinar. This session, as well as all our events, are posted to the UNIDO YouTube channel, and we will make sure that all of the materials you have requested will reach your inboxes. If you have any additional questions or you would like to connect with our team directly, you can either reach out on montrealprotocol at uni.org or you can reach out through our social media websites in LinkedIn or Facebook. Thank you very much for your time. Have a wonderful rest of your day and goodbye.